the 24th chapter. Uh, and we're going to look now at verse 14. I love Joshua. Joshua is an example to us all how we need to represent God. Uh -oh. Now we've been talking about a generation who know not God. Yeah. And we can't point and wag our finger because some of it is our fault. Yeah. Oh, Say that. One of the great work of the church in the end times, and I just believe that we are in the last days. Yeah. But one of the great work of the church in the last days is that we have the gospel message and God's desire and will is for us to share it. That's, it. That's our job. Our, shop, our job is we are light bearers. Yeah. We bear the light of salvation yeah. to men. That's one of our jobs. It's been left in our hands. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending Jesus. He's not sending nobody else. He's using the church to reflect his light. So in verse 14 of Joshua 24, it says, Now fear the Lord, says Joshua. And serve him with all faithfulness. Go away to God's your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River mm -hmm. and in Egypt. And serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day uh -oh. whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors sir, beyond the Euphrates, or the God of the Amorites, in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Father, once again, we thank you. We ask your blessings over your word. Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. Yes. Use me your vessel. Please. I step down and decrease. Yes, Lord. And you step up. Use my mind, my thoughts. Hallelujah. And all, Lord, of me with passion to give what you have given. Mm -hmm. We love you. We honor you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Yes. Amen. Amen. The generation to come. Yeah. Say it with me. The generation to come. As I look at this particular text, Joshua's time on earth is coming to an end. The scripture teaches that it is appointed for a man who wants to die. Yeah. And after that, the judgment. And so all of us must go. But this was a time period in which Joshua had ran on. We know Joshua was faithful. We see time and time again of God uh, 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 declaring how he was faithful and loyal to him. Even when he had sent uh, the spies out. And, and we had uh, 10 of them that came back with a bad report. But then there was two of them who had faith. On. One of them was, was Caleb and the other one was Joshua. Right. And so Joshua had a rep reputation of one who knew and loved and trusted God. Yeah. What type of reputation do you have today? Uh -oh. And so I love Joshua because he remained with the Lord. He reverenced the Lord. When the people were having orgies and, and, and serving idol gods and when the Lord's wrath came up on them and he opened up the earth and they died all in one day and the Lord done many great and marvelous things, you know, and things that will cause fear to come up on uh, the people, some of them still didn't fear. But Joshua did. Yeah. And he was one that was declared by the Lord faithful. And so he began to talk to uh, the people of Israel, and he began to declare unto them about how they are to, 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 to do some things, and we're going to get into that. But the first step in which he had talked about in the generation to come they have a call, and we have a call to choose. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Well, yeah. I love Joshua because he leaves the people to their liberty. Yeah. We all have free will. That's right. We can keep it gangster. We can keep it street. Yeah. 
We can be trill, we can be murderers, we can be whoremongers and pimps, we can be prostitutes, we can be whatever we think we want to be. Because God has given us free will. Right, come on. And so he leaves the people to their liberty. But then he declares his pledge personally. <laughs> come on, man. And not only personally, but his household to the same service to the Lord. And he said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yeah. And so there's a call to choose. Jesus said these words in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 20. He said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Now we see here in this particular text, uh, a revelation where the Lord gives us a, 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 a description here of him standing at the door. Mm -hmm. This is the exalted Christ, Jesus Christ, waiting for admission. He stands at the door. What's the door? The heart of men. Men and women's heart. He stands at the door of our hearts waiting for admission. And when we allow him to come in and sup, that word sup is a place where he refreshes the soul with the grace and conditions of his spirit. The Bible said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be what? Feel. And so it's a call to choose. And in this generation, uh, we have what we call millennials, and we have some people that are baby boomers, but fit the generation and the description of the times in which we live. Yeah. Yeah. For there is a generation who know not God. Yeah. But there's a, a call to choose. What do you mean, preacher? I'm glad you asked. We choose a life of reverence and honor of God, or we choose something else. Now, when your choice is a choice uh, of, a, of a life of reverence and honor of God, this means that you, you respect God. Right. In Proverbs, the first chapter, verse 7, says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Right. Now, this means that when, when you fear God, you reverence him, you respect him. But it says, is the beginning of knowledge. And so to have true knowledge is to perceive rightly, to understand. And, and a lot of our problems is how we see a thing. How we perceive our perspective. It, just a change of perspective can make a difference in our lives. But he said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And so we're able to have true knowledge, which is to perceive God rightly, to understand who he is and what he has done and what he shall do. And then it talks about, but fools despise wisdom. A fool rejects God's perspective. Uh -huh. I ain't got time for God. Have you ever heard somebody tell you, I ain't got time for that church? Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't have people say that to us. Amen. We ain't got time for that. As we evangelize, I ain't got time for the people with me. Church people. <laughs> a fool rejects God's perspective. In Proverbs 9, verse 10, here it is, the writer repeats himself. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. And so now we see here wisdom, which is the ability to understand the divine perspective and apply it to life. When you have wisdom, you understand how God perceives things or sees things, and you apply what he says to your life. This is personally. We need wisdom. In Romans, the third chapter, verse 18, it says, There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is, this is scary right here. This means people use every part of themselves, their bodies, they use their minds, they use their heart to rebel against the word and will of God. And so all of us stand condemned 
Because we all have sinned and fallen short. And so we all, every one of us, need salvation. Yeah. It's a call to choose. We either choose a life of reverence and honor of God, or we choose a life of self and denial to God. In Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 19, and here it is again. This day I call the heavens and the earth as a witness against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the Lord sets it all by saying straight out. He said, listen, this day I'm calling heaven and earth as a witness against you. He said, I said before you life and death. Now you got a choice. You choose life and you will live. And your children will be blessed. And so th this is what we have to really understand that we can be a bad example before our children. I never forget my father told me that. He said, son, I was your biological father, but I was a bad example in front of you. I said, really? He said, yeah, man. I had, they used to have armrests. They called it the pimp stew. Mm -hmm. And he said, I have a gun under there, a joint in my mouth, and you sitting on the pimp stew. That's a bad example. And a lot of people have children and are bad examples, but they won't admit it. They won't own up to how they have misrepresented parenthood before their children. You know, it ought to be a whole lot of testimony. Listen, baby, don't go down the street. I went down. You don't want to do that. Listen, let me explain to you. I've done that, and it's anguish and frustration. We can choose a life of self and denial to God. You can live to please you. You can live to glorify or uh, to, to uh, gratify. That's the word. Gratify what you want. You can, you can live a life of denying God. Keep telling him over again, no, not right. No, I ain't ready. No, I ain't ready. He said, if you hear my, hear my voice. Or not your heart. In Philippians, the second chapter, verse 3, this is a good one here. Philippians 2 and 3, it says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, valuing others above yourself. Amen. Now, when we, we choose, we have a choice to serve the Lord. And when we serve the Lord, it is a is to live a life of sincerity in Christ. Christians should be sincere. We should be hypocrites. All through the New Testament gospel, we saw Jesus come against religious leaders who looked the part, who knew the part, but didn't do the part. And so as God's people, we should be sincere in Christ. Hosea, the fourth chapter, says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. And I also will reject you from being my priest for me because you have forgotten the law of your God. I also will forget your children. Mama. Scary situation here. Here was the priests, the leaders, instead of them being examples. Instead of them, you know, God was, he was very angry with the leader's sin. He was mad at the people's sin, but he was mad, mad at the leader's sin who ought to have been examples to the people, leading them to worship and honor the Lord. But instead, they fell into sin as well. They rejected knowledge. They knew what God said to but they didn't do it anyway. And I, I, I tried that when I was young. I said, you know what, maybe when I get older, I'll give my life to the Lord. I might be a deacon or something. But right now, I got some stuff I want to do. 
And so, you know, this is what God is, is, is coming against today. Yeah. You know, he said, you got a choice. On, He's given us a calling. The generation has a calling. The people today have a calling. And either we're going to choose God or not. Yes, and so because in Hosea's days, the leaders didn't follow God, they would share in the punishment of the, those in whom they led, who had fallen into sin. It's sad, you see, see the, the pastor in hell, burning in hell. And all the people who rebelled against God, the ones that was, you know, to the left, to the left, to the back, to the back. All the ones that had went against God, didn't want to have no time for God. You know, they wanted God to bless them. They want to use God for his blessings. But all there, you see the preacher, they're burning to and shit. You got to have more than the God talk. To serve the Lord is to live a life of sincerity in Christ. To serve the Lord is to live a life belonging to Christ. In Luke 11, verse 23, it's a powerful verse. Jesus says, whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters me. Wow. This is something here. One thing you and I have to look at is that there's... No, there can be no neutrality when it comes to Jesus Christ. Amen. Either you in or you not. There's no neutral place. You know, and it's not no middle. You can't straddle the fence. I'm so grateful my uncle told me, he said, nephew, you can't straddle the fence. I was like, what does that mean? I didn't know what the, the that means you got one foot on this side and another foot on that. You, you dangling from the fence. Either you on this side or you not. And so there's no neutral. Right. He said, he who is, is not with me, he's against me. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. And so to serve the Lord is to live a life belonging to Christ. To serve the Lord is to live a life abandoned to Christ. Oh, wait, this is good. Not only do I belong to him. The person, the one, the, the Lamb of God, the one who suffered, bled, and died, and was buried in the grave. Yes. And on the third day, the tomb, he had the, the rock was moved. Him. Not your church home, not your beautiful cathedral, not your loving pastor. Yes. Yes. Not your dear grandma. Or whomever it is that you look to and you, you got, got as a, a model. No, the person, Jesus. The one who died for you. The one, the only way that he was the propitiation. That means he was sufficient yeah. in God's eyes. Yeah. We don't understand it. Right. Our job is to believe. That's right. Right. We believe what his words say. Yeah. And so to serve the Lord is to live a life abandoned to the Lord. I love the Apostle Paul. He was the greatest Christian I ever you know, understood that was the greatest Christian ever to me. In, ver in chapter 9, verse 3, we know that he was a persecutor of the church. And here it was, he, as he was on his way doing his business of, of persecuting men and women, throwing them in jail, as he neared the Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And he replied, and, and he said, now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. He said, you get up, and you're going to be told what you must do. And so, uh, uh, as, a, as we serve the Lord, we must be abandoned to the Lord. That means we obey Him. Yeah. What He say trumps what we feel, think, or won't. He blinded uh, Saul and told him, you go down the straight street. And you're going to wait there until I tell the man to put his hands on you so you can see again. You wonder why you're in a hard place? Maybe God is dealing with you. Yes. Yes. Sometimes God deals with us in hard places. Yes. 
Also, to serve the Lord is to live a life of faith in Christ. It's a life of faith. Serving the Lord is a life of faith. We walk by faith. Faith in what God has said, not faith in what we can just dream up. What does God say? In, in Matthew, this is a, a, a bank scripture you can hold on to, the sixth chapter, verse 33, one of my favorite scriptures to stand on. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And so when you put God first in his way of living, Brother Landry, he's going to add all these things to you. The things you need, things you want. I, I tell a testimony about how I had prayed. I said, Lord, you know, I want a barbershop. I was cutting hair in my basement. And, you know, for years I cut hair. And when the Lord blessed me, he blessed me with a barbershop with chairs. I had five chairs in it. He blessed me with a beauty shop with three chairs in it. He blessed me with a three-bedroom house all in one blessing. One shot. And so when you give God your life, when you ask God, Lord, what do you want me to do? When I met the Lord, I said, okay, Lord, I surrender. It's over for me as far as what I want to do. And so that's what abandoned me. A life of faith means you honor God. Now, you don't get that blessing and then forget about God. I tell the young men all the time, I really want your business. But the weed you smoke it make me look like I'm smoking it with you. Mm -hmm. Because of how strong it smells. Yeah. People don't know, boy, if, if after a few years down the line, they're going to find out what marijuana is doing to them. Wow. Because it's too strong. Yeah. I know all about it. You know? I've been there and done that. But the, the stuff they got now is, <laughs> is synthetic. Yeah. It's, it's too strong. Yeah. And so if it's fumigating, if somebody was, if had smoked a joint when they came here, we all would know it. <laughs> and we living in a generation where the people will smell your place up and not care. And they want us to lay down all of our standards. I'll let them come as you are. Man, you smell like that, you need to not come. If you want to do drugs and then come to church, what is that about? And we got to smell it? People don't like that, but I'm telling like it is. I don't want to smell it. It gives me a headache. And so we live in a time now where what was sacred is not being held as sacred. It's not being held as sacred. And so then we just want to say when they die, oh, well, he with the Lord, rest in peace. Ain't no rest in peace. And you lost? Death, is, death should be the marker to let us know, man, dude is in trouble. And me too if I don't repent. And so we live in a time where a generation has just been let everything, don't, don't tell me you don't like this about me or you don't like that about me. I got rights. Remember I had an auntie, man, that lit into me real good because my little cousin came and he was smelling like weed. And when we, when we told him, man, get on out of here smelling like that, because he almost got a teenager whooped because the parent of the teenager thought it was him. But no, it was an adult cousin of mine who got off parole and said, I'm going to smoke a joint today because I'm off paper. I'm going to celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> and because she was the one who had, had gave it to him, she had an issue with me. Y'all don't put nobody out of church. I said, listen, we got a right to not accept that smell in our church. Just because that's something that's your pleasure, your sin of choice, it's not ours. Amen. And we stand against it. That goes for the boat and everything else that the culture is into. Amen. Amen. I wanted to write that song so bad, Jason. Get off that boat or hook you like dope. Get off that boat. Get off that boat when you come up show. Get off that boat. I want to go down to the Argosy and just with a bugle horn, get off that boat when you go broke. Get off that boat. I was thinking about the county jail and how I would have been sitting there. I said, nah, I think I'm going to leave that song alone. I'm just going to preach it. Get off that boat. But we live in a culture where people are running out. Now, they had the old, older saints trick. Now the younger saints is falling into that deception. Quit it. I just, you know, this is not my sin of choice. I'd rather have some, some bags from the Nike outlet, 
for the pillars and something than to be giving my money to some casino. At least I got something to show for. <laughs> Trip or something. But this is what the generate, this is what the enemy is deceiving. The good people, these are good people, these are people that God loved and that God has sent his son to purchase their redemption, but they living like hellions. This has been going on since the day of Joshua. And we will be foolish to reject the knowledge of God. Knowing that this is wrong, but doing it anyway. We got a whole generation we want to help. And so when you serve in the Lord, it's to live a life of faith in Christ. That means that the Lord will sustain you. I had to really deal with that because I was one that was bored quickly and so on. I needed, you know, fulfillment and stuff. And I said, Lord, I don't want to get bored of the word of God. I don't want to get bored with worshiping. You know, Lord, you know, keep me from that spirit. You know, because some people fall into that. Ah, uh, what else can we do? I need a drink. I'm getting drunk tonight. Don't give me some patrol or whatever they drinking. Some people are like that. You know, they get bored too quick with the Lord. I pray. I said, Lord, you know, please, Lord, help me not to fall into that spirit. Because God is sufficient. He will satisfy you. He will fill you with all the yeah. virtue and satisfaction that you can have. Oh, all that you need is in Jesus. Yeah. I'm a living witness of that. It's too much of God. He never gets old. Come on. Yeah. Just in his presence can, can do something new in you like never before. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that his presence has done for me is healed some of the trauma that I went through. Yeah. I, I come up in a cussing house, a fight house. My parents fought. You know, my parents could have easily been Black Panthers, both of them. My mom still swears she won. <laughs> but I grew up in a time where folks would get into it. Folks would get cussed out and all that. And so some of those tra traumatic you know, and, and you as a child, you supposed to go in there and sit down and shut up. Yeah. You know, and yeah, you bet. You get killed right. on the spot. I've been slapped in the mouth on the spot. I don't know what these children have. But on the spot, I've been combed upside the head. You know, it takes a while for that pain to go down. You know, I've been put in check. Learn loose lips will sink the ship. <laughs> I brought you in this world, boy. I take you out. That's tattooed on my scalp. <laughs> she wasn't playing. Either. Another thing that the presence of God has done for me personally, this is my little moment of testimony. We all right, child. It, uh, uh, his presence has healed my emotional wounds. Yeah. I had some emotional, you know, wounds. You know, I had things that people said about me, decreed about me. Yeah. You know, you ain't nothing like this, and you ain't gonna be nothing like that, and all those things. So now I know my worth and value. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. And that helped me because when you're in a room full of preachers, you're not arrogant, but you're confident because you know God chose you his, you his choice. You're the Lord's choice. He gives a universal invitation. He says, come unto me all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And so now I have confidence in me, and I don't need other things to prop me up. Yeah. You know, in the world, we have to have a certain this and a certain that. We have to have our hair a certain way, and we have to stand a certain way, and we have to be a certain weight, and we have to, you know, handle ourselves. Y'all yeah. look at me, y'all know what I'm talking about. But in Christ, we free. Yeah. I'm free to be me. I'm a new creation. Some of those things that I, would, I was involved in wasn't me. I was trying to fit in with the culture. And so he's healed. His presence has healed that. Not a church service. That's intimate time with me. 
you know, just me and you, Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Everything else can wait. Yeah. Just in that place right there that Monty was singing about in that place, that's where I got those healing. That's why when I see, when I see people that I used to be in tune with, I don't instantly have memorization there. Now I see that person differently. Because God didn't throw me away, I'm not throwing them away. So there's healing there in his presence. Tell me what my God can't do. Some of you need to get in his presence. That's your problem. That's your problem right there. You need to get in his presence. I always tell those who serve in the church, Sister Bob, don't serve so much the way you didn't have time to bask in his presence. Yeah. You know, it ain't about doing. That's Martha. It's about Mary, too. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. He, she chose the best part. You know, and then when things didn't, when things didn't go the way they wanted with their brother, guess what? Mary didn't fall apart. Yeah. But Martha was falling apart. Yeah. 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 That's why we need his presence. We need to meet with him in the morning. Meet with him in the noonday. We need to let prayer be like breathing. We need a plan to go to church on Sunday. You know, some of the under God leaders, I see y'all now, but y'all wasn't here this morning. Shame on you. But, you know, don't wear your life out. Don't wear your life out. So many people, I lost a friend of mine this week that I grew up with. We grew up, I'm talking about four or five year old grow up. And he said he had 10 years to retire from the motor company. But he didn't make those 10 years. You can be so busy zooming, 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 and then you can get to retirement and be like my friend Arthur. Yeah. Now you gotta take prostate, you got prostate cancer. Yeah. You gotta enjoy the journey. Yes, you have to slow yourself down. We got too many options, Dominique. We gotta slow down in this world. We gotta slow down. We gotta say, okay, Lord, what, what are you saying, God? I know, I'm ready to jump in. You ever went and seen some, some air matches that was on sale? You're like, I'm a walker. You may jump in. What, what is God saying? <laughs> About this sale? What other obligations do you have, sir? <laughs> Ma'am? <laughs> well, you jump in. That's right. You tell the truth. I'm just preaching in this quiet time. Right? It. It's a call to choose. We got so many different choices. We choose everything. We choose. You know, to be with this person, we choose to be with that person. We choose the wrong thing sometimes. God has given us this freedom and we be jacking it up. That's why we got to ask him, Lord, I need you to lead. I need sensitivity. I need, to, I need to be able to say, when you say this is not for me, I need to be able to be cool with that. Come on now, This is what I'm talking about. Let me say my final point. We can go home. We can choose a life of reverence and honor to God or a life of self and denial to God or choose a life of replacing God and an attitude of rejecting God. And Joshua told him, you know, he said, listen, you can choose to go over there. You can do whatever. But guess what? As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Now, this is what happened here. We learned in the weeks past about how the people went horn after the other gods, the, the idols, the, the meaningless God. And they called, they forsook the way of the Lord. And you can forsake the way of the Lord. And this is my own conviction. I don't want to live saved and passionate for God for 30 years. And in the last 10 years of my life, I'm a hellion. I'm a perpetrator. I'm shady. I'm a reverend do wrong. You know, I'm a hypocrite. I, I don't want I want to finish strong. I want to be like Paul who said, I fought the good fight of faith. I kept the faith. You know, I stayed the course. You know, I want to, I want to, I don't want to lose ground. I want to gain ground. We can choose a life of replacing God. An attitude of rejecting God. 
Romans 1, verse 18. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has shown it to them. Mm -mm. This, this scripture here really helps us because God has made every man aware of right and wrong. Yeah. Come on, Pastor. Come on. You know, he's, you know, every diabolical plan, every plot, every scheme, every setup, every trap, you know, every conspiracy. We know what we do. Because he's made it known to us. And so here is, a, is you know, our conscience reveals to us what's wrong and what's right. Our conscience, our conscience knows, it, it, it lets us know that this really ain't right. You don't need to look at that person. Or when this person go this way, you don't need to look that way. For whatever it is in you that maybe say, what she got on? You know, or how this person backside look or you know whatever thoughts that may come to the mind that ain't of God Amen. you don't have to yield to that the thoughts is trying to get you to move and do in the wrong way don't do that Amen. you know don't let Satan control you and don't let your nature control you because the carnal, carnal nature is enmity with God the carnal mind and thinking of the carnal mind is against God and so you know, we all have passions, we all have appetites, we all have desires, but it's our job to know what's right and what's wrong. And then to make a choice. And so God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Meaning that we know that God has a punishment for those who reject or replace God. You can't replace him. You can't reject him. You know, and so this is why you and I must, you know, we must be aware of what the scriptures say about what we do and how we live. And so it, it teaches us that the Bible says that there's going to be some that's going to go to everlasting life and some that's going to go to eternal damnation. That's a place where you're condemned from God Forever is no is no do-overs. That's the problem with our generation. A lot of times people drive these cars real fast because they've been playing that grand theft auto. <laughs> Grown men. And so now they want to speed out, they want to fish tail. And so we see these black markings and we see people getting all these souped up cars and they try to and they hurting people on the road. And one young man, I, I, I caught him on 75th Street, and I said, man, I see you driving crazy, man. Well, don't you know you can hurt somebody? He said, they better get out of my way. Oh. <laughs> I said, man, you're going to get a vehicle lur homicide charge. And the first thing you're going to be saying is, can I get a plea? Because they're going to slap so much time on you. And you're going to be crying, talking about, I want to see if I can get a plea, a lesser sentence. Because of you rejecting this knowledge. Man, there's people, we got family members that travel these roads. This is what's going on. And so they had these parties where they're spinning around and spinning around and spinning around. People observing and watching. They think that's hip. And in our time, we grew up a little differently. People was cruising. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we was cruising and we was we, you know, we was more smooth and we live in a generation where these people think they speed race. They can't even handle a car for real. And so, you know, when, when, when someone's trying to warn you of things, you know, it's, it, you know it, it can really help you. We had a family member, he really was like family. Uh, we called him Bird. And, and the thing he told me when I was 10 years old, because I couldn't wait to get grown. I was counting the years now. I'm going to be grown. I want to be grown. I want to be grown. Boy, I was not crazy. <laughs> but he taught me something about a man with a uniform on. And he said, a man that wears a uniform is respected. I said, for real? He said, yeah. He said, I don't care if it's a 
McDonald's, he used Hardee's, he used, you know, he said, that man ain't even got to have a car. If a person has a uniform on, he's going to be respected. I said, for real? Because a person is going to work every day. That's right. And eventually, they may get them a pickup truck, right. or they may go from the bus to drive. But people will reverence that person because of their commitment to a company. Yes, sir. But on contrast, people are not going to respect you. You ain't got over 18 and you're not holding a job down consistently. You're not going to have respect for that. And so, so and when he told me that, I said, man, I'm going to keep me a uniform on. Yeah. I want to be respected. Yeah. I got on one today. Yeah. And so, so, so the point I'm making is that a working person, man or woman, is bad. You know, no man wants to marry a woman who won't work. Man. There's some women that's, that's like that. They will work out, they be, you know, they do all these exercises and stay in shape because they want a man to give them about 1100 a week. Oh. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> and if you really want to know the description of that, that's a prostitute. That's a prostitute. But we have some people that, that practice it. This is what some people, girl, he ain't paying. Girl, he got that money. And he's sharing it. You know about that at the beauty shop? They talk about it. Girl, he showed me $70,000. And so, now, you know, all of a sudden, he didn't, girl, you didn't let him buy you? You can be bought? Come on now, I'm talking in here. You mean to tell me you can be bought? What does the script? That's why we need the scriptures because left to our carnal mind, we think this is good when it got a cost to it. He didn't get you all that money, and now when you don't act right, he just smacked you in the mouth. Because he feel like he owned you, he just slapped you in the mouth. Or he just scared you so much where you don't even want to call the police. You know what I'm talking about? And so these are things that are in the world, but we have a choice. If we're going to affect the generation to come, and we want to be a part of the generation that is redeemed. We can sing soon and soon and very soon. We're going to see the, the king or when the saints go marching in on how I want to be in that number or Jesus getting us ready for that great day. We can talk all that all we want to. Yeah. But there's a certain group of people called the redeemed of the Lord. Yeah. And when you've been redeemed, you're not going back touching that stuff. You're not going back touching that. Don't touch the unclean thing. People's lives have been damaged big time. And so we have a, a, a great opportunity to help people out of the fire, out of the hands of the Lord. But first of all, we can't replace God either. We need to be aware of replacing and rejecting God. He said, I won't be first. I won't be second to nobody else. Let's stand to our feet.